There is no weapon of mass destruction more terrifying than a bioweapon. Nuclear warheads, devastating as they may be, are targeted, and they're limited in yield in the size of their blast. Chemical weapons, they only travel so far, they only kill or maim in the ways they're designed to, and they can be counteracted, at least in some circumstances. But a bioweapon, that's a different beast. Once it escapes into the wild, a pathogen can travel and infect in ways that are entirely unpredictable. They can mutate, become deadlier or more transmissible, and spread all around the world in a span of days under the right circumstances. They're hard to detect until people start dying, and by then it's almost impossible to find a cure in time to prevent widespread devastation. In the United States, biological weapons fall under the dominion of the BWC, the Biological Weapons Convention, a treaty that all but a tiny handful of nations have signed. They're staunchly prohibited, entirely banned, and disavowed as barbaric weapons of a bygone era. But at the United States Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Disease, otherwise known as Ysamred, the world's most dangerous bioweapons still exist under lock and key. In order to defend against the deadly diseases of tomorrow, they must be understood today, even if that means breeding and cultivating the most dangerous pathogens of all time. Biological weapons became a major problem for the United States during World War II, when both of America's major adversaries at the time, Nazi Germany in Europe and Imperial Japan in Asia, had shown that they would use every power at their disposal to wreak havoc against the Allied powers. Ultimately, those fears would never be realized during the war, especially since Nazi Germany got a rather late start in limited research at the Dachau concentration camp. Japan's forays into bioweapons were a good deal more terrifying via the research and development unit known as Unit 731. But their efforts were almost entirely directed towards China. Captured intel and scientists after the war would make it clear to the United States just how advanced and dangerous Japan's bioweapons have been, and much of that information would make its way into America's own biological weapons program at the start of the Cold War. As part of America's bioweapons program, a laboratory complex was established at what was then known as Camp Dietrich, today Fort Dietrich in the state of Maryland, not far from the nation's capital. There, the so-called biological warfare laboratories were mostly focused on the defensive side of biological warfare, at least officially, while offensive components like engineering superbugs or breeding pathogens were handled elsewhere. Fort Detrick did house no fewer than four production plants for biological agents, including anthrax, and many of the details of its operations during these years were kept highly classified, including a since declassified plan to use yellow fever-infested mosquitoes on enemy territory. But the broad scope of the focus there, nonetheless, included more defensive research than any of America's other installations at the time. At Fort Detrick, an organization known as the Army Medical Unit, a relatively innocuous name for the things they were doing, would take over a range of operations. These included one Project White Coat, a long-running program where enlisted volunteers from the US Army were subject to scientific experimentation with bioweapons. These volunteers were mostly conscientious objectors, people who refused to engage in traditional military service for religious or freedom of conscious reasons, but were still subjected to the draft. For 19 years, some 2,300 volunteer soldiers would allow themselves to be infected with everything from the Black Plague to yellow fever to hepatitis A and more. All of it took place at Fort Detrick, and it was here that the organization today known as USAMRID got its start. In the 1960s and 70s, the organization received a flood of new scientists and other personnel from all over the US military and civil sector. These were people who had, up until that point, been involved with America's efforts to produce offensive bioweapons, but who had seen their research shut down in the face of America's work on global anti-bioweapon conventions. With their arrival meant a tremendous flux of expertise and a spot at the head of America's bioweapons research initiatives. With their work now clearly framed as defensive in nature, in keeping with the Biological Weapons Convention, the Ysamrid Institution grew into one of just a few organizations in the US that were capable of handling advanced biological threats alongside the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, and a small handful of others. Today, Ysamrid is the only laboratory within the architecture of the United States Department of Defense that's capable of handling and studying the most dangerous biological agents. These agents, held under a degree of safety precautions known as BSL-4, are the ones that are easily transmitted in a laboratory environment, will cause severe or fatal disease in human handlers, and have no known vaccines and no known treatments. 
These are the sorts of biological agents where one lab accident and one infected person going home to their family at the day's end without realizing they're infected could quickly set off a health emergency that makes some of the outbreaks of the last half century look like child's play. The Ebola virus, the Lassa virus, the Hendra virus, the Nipah virus, and more are contained in Yasamrid's walls, any of which could devastate global populations if they're handled with anything less than the highest possible standard of care. Yasamrid today employs about 800 people, drawing not just from the US Army's best and brightest, but from a pool of highly knowledgeable civilian scientists as well. They work primarily out of the Dan Crozier building, equipped with state-of-the-art facilities that are kept under tight security and staffed by teams of specialized support and response workers who serve as an extra layer of security against pathogen mishaps or mishandling. At this particular military installation, it's just as important to prevent things from getting out as it is to stop bad actors from getting in. The scientists and researchers at Fort Detrick live at the cutting edge of biological weapons research, and as a result, they're responsible for a range of critical innovations, both past and present. Given its status as a defensive research organization, Yasamrit is charged with pursuing constant evolutions in biomedical research. Although the contributions to global science have perhaps not saved as many lives as the contributions of other organizations, they've prevented more potential deaths than possibly all but a select few organizations across all of human history. A major piece of Yasamrid's scientific contribution is in its dedication to biocontainment. This is an exceptionally important aspect of work with pathogens, ensuring that they're kept in the best possible conditions to prevent their escape from the lab. It's important to emphasize many of the pathogens Yasamrid works with are found only rarely in the wild and next to never in the developed world, meaning that global society is just entirely unprepared for an incidental release. Yasamrid pioneered biocontainment procedures, including the biosafety level system that we just mentioned. Pathogens at biosafety level one or BSL one would be, as Yasamrid's own website puts it, quote, comparable to an open bench laboratory found in a school classroom. No special precautions would be needed. At BSL level four, the highest level, people working with a dangerous pathogen must wear specialized suits and breathe filtered air exclusively. Yasamrit uses a very wide range of decontamination tools, including heat-based, pressure-based, and chemical-based systems to treat all liquid and solid wastes that the laboratory produces in order to leave a next to 0% chance of any leakage, while their air filtration systems are of exceptional quality. Just as important is a piece of equipment referred to as the PPPS, or the Positive Pressure Personnel Suits. Similar to a spacesuit meant to be worn on Earth, these bulky suits are meant to be completely airtight and totally encapsulating for the human body. They're kept more pressurized than the outside air, so even if a suit were damaged, air would blow outward instead of allowing potentially deadly pathogens to waft inward. They're often connected to tubes that feed air directly from the building's delivery systems rather than even taking the risk of filtering the air immediately surrounding them. They're difficult to use, they require extensive training to operate, and as of today, the ones in use at Fort Detrick boast a perfect safety record. Then there's the Aeromedical Isolation Team, a crack team of rapid response doctors, nurses, and support personnel with the capability to travel anywhere in the world at basically a moment's notice and set up and handle a bioweapons response at the highest level of biocontainment. Granted global aircraft capability by the US military, the Aeromedical Isolation Team, or AIT, travel with a portable containment laboratory, allowing them to deal with even the most dangerous pathogens with minimal prep or information going in. Their mission extends beyond the response to biological weapons in wartime and includes both bioterrorism response and the extraction of scientists from remote parts of the world in the event that they've contracted rare, exotic, or possibly even unidentified or unknown diseases. Ultimately, the IIT was decommissioned in 2010 after 32 years standing on ready. Luckily, they were only called upon four times in the space of those three plus decades. But in their heyday, there was no other team that could come close to the capabilities they offered. Fort Dietrich has studied a range of exceptionally deadly pathogens, but perhaps none quite so thoroughly as anthrax. 
A bacterium that produces infectious spores, anthrax kills one in four people it infects from skin infections alone, and up to four out of every five once it settles into the respiratory system. Ysamrid has conducted extensive studies on the Ebola virus, a pathogen that kills between 25 and 90% of people infected with it depending on the outbreak and the available level of treatment. They've also done extensive work with Lassa fever, a hemorrhagic virus for which there is no vaccine, as well as the bubonic plague, and that needs no introduction. They've worked with the highly toxic poison ricin, rare and highly deadly diseases from all corners of the globe, and diseases that could be leveraged for biological warfare attacks not just against humans, but against livestock and other animals that the United States depends on for both food and ecological stability. Ysamrid has been on the front lines of a range of outbreaks and emergencies over the last few decades. In the 1970s, it intervened in an outbreak of Rift Valley fever in Egypt and worked to address several hemorrhagic fevers from around the world. In the 80s, they were on the ground dealing with outbreaks of simian fever and developing a range of new genetics-based treatments for infectious disease. In the 1990s, they dispatched a full six specialized laboratories worth of teams to assist in the Gulf War, standing ready to identify and dismantle biological weapons programs of the Iraqi regime, although, thankfully, none were ever identified. And in the 2000s, Ysamrid would take the lead on dealing with the Amerithrax crisis, a bioterror incident that saw anthrax-laced letters kill five people and make 17 others ill. Over half a decade later, however, a Ysamrid scientist named Dr. Bruce Ivins was identified as the only culprit of the attacks. Ivins would end his own life just weeks before the FBI identified him. Perhaps among the most important work of Ysamrid in the 21st century is the effort to develop a system to detect a pathogen in the field. To this day, despite decades of work by Ysamrid and a number of government and private endeavors around the world, there is still no way to detect infectious agents floating in the air while a person is out in the field. Fort Dietrich, though, is right on the cusp of changing that. They've produced a prototype handheld device that will allow US soldiers to identify not just infectious diseases, but biological warfare agents, and they will be able to do this quickly and efficiently in the field. Referred to as the Dragon Medic, the device uses relatively cheap off-the-shelf hardware to test pathogens, quote, in real time at the point of exposure, according to a US Army announcement on the subject. Rather than waste time on development behind closed doors, the Army is pushing early units out to the field for real-time testing in hopes that real-world advancement will help to push the research and development side even further. Of course, any discussion of your SAMRED or any other organization or facility like it brings up a very real element of concern. After all, the US and the vast majority of world nations are signatory to a convention that outright prohibits the development of offensive biological warfare capabilities, yet across the whole world, be it in the US or Russia or China or any other nation, big or small, there's always that fear. There's always the real and entirely understandable concern that biological weapons, dare we say the ultimate terror among even weapons of mass destruction, might not be completely gone behind closed doors and layers and layers of classification. After all, this is a place where American scientists flocked from all over the country's pre-existing bioweapons programs when they were shut down during the Cold War. In reality, while we certainly couldn't claim to look upon the deepest, darkest heart of American WMD research, it appears that the research happening at Fort Detrick is entirely above board. A major part of the Biological Weapons Convention is that its signatories cooperate with each other to verify and make sure that everybody is complying, and Fort Detrick is a model institution for compliance within the United States. Now, of course, there are lots of issues with the Biological Weapons Convention. It's not actually enforceable by any mandate, and its signatory members don't have to disclose everything they do or everywhere they do it. But at least at the Fort Detrick facilities of Ysamrid, global monitors have long attested that they not only do safe and trustworthy work, but indispensable work to keep America and the rest of the world safe from highly potent infectious diseases. Whether you take that as an indicator that all is well, or whether the more conspiratorially minded among us decide that the nefarious things must be going on elsewhere, well, that's up to you. But where Fort Detrick has been, shall we say, a bit less reassuring in its practices is on the subject of lab safety. In 2019, America's most important bioweapons research facility was ordered to stop all research into the deadliest pathogens in its possession, effective immediately, due to fears that contaminated waste could be leaking out into the world. The order, handed down by the CDC, forbade Ysamrid from handling the Ebola virus, anthrax, and smallpox, as well as other highly restricted bioagents. The problem was, 
in a new decontamination system that Fort Detrick had recently installed to deal with wastewater after their long-standing prior facility, a steam sterilization plant, was destroyed by a flood. The Samrit was now relying on chemicals to decontaminate wastewater, but a combination of mechanical failures and failures by researchers at the facility would lead to the CDC concluding that the chemical treatments were not enough to protect public health. The facility would be partially shut down for months before operations with the deadliest diseases were allowed to restart in a limited capacity. Nor was this the only time that Fort Detrick would raise concerns of improper handling of biological materials. In 2009, Yasamrid was temporarily suspended after it was found to be storing pathogens that hadn't been listed as part of its inventory. The panic that resulted from less than stringent accounting of its pathogen stores in 2009 was a direct byproduct of the panic that arose during and after the Amerithrax case. Government investigations into Fort Detrick at that time had found that the doctor who took anthrax out, Dr. Ivans, had been able to access it and that it was insufficiently secured and that the anthrax had escaped from secure areas of the building where it was bred to non-secured and unprotected areas elsewhere. We should emphasize, for clarity's sake here, that no formal charges were ever filed against Ivans and no direct evidence of his role as a sole perpetrator of the attack was ever uncovered. Even if Fort Detrick's experimentation and research are entirely defensive in nature, which again, they do appear to be, it is still important to stress that laboratory safety is on a whole other level of urgency in this place. It is among a very small number of places on Earth where such dangerous pathogens are bred, cultivated, and kept in close proximity to massive communities of people where a leaked virus could be halfway around the world tomorrow. It is more than anything a balancing act, and for the sake of the entire world, the balancing act of Yasamrid had best continue for a very long time.